Welcome everyone to the Addiction 911 show. We're very excited to be here today. Today our topic is going to be tough love. Does it really help an addict? My name is Christina Rowe and I'm your host of the Addiction 911 show and the podcast, which this will be a podcast also on iTunes and Podomatic. And we're waiting for a few more guests, but we wanted to get started. So I'm going to introduce you right now to our first guest, Rachel Simpson from Dynamic Recovery Center. Um, and it's PHP IOP OP Treatment Center. Is that correct? Correct. Correct. Okay. Welcome, Rachel. So great to have you here. Thank um, you. As we wait for everyone else to come in, so we can start chatting a little bit about this subject. So tell us a little bit about more about yourself and and what exactly um, how you help um, at Dynamic Recovery Centers. I'm the owner of Dynamic Recovery Center, and I'm also the clinical program director. Are you hearing feedback? I'm hearing some feedback. Yes, I'm here. It's a little. It's not really feedback. It sounds like you're a little cr- um, crackling a little bit. So maybe if you just go a little closer to the phone, it might be. Yeah, talk more into the mic. Is that better? That is better. Okay. So yes, I am. I have one partner, and we own Dynamic Recovery Center in Fort Lauderdale. We also own um, Dynamic Counseling Center, which is primarily outpatient practice. Um, we've had that since 2011. And in 2015, decided to go um, up a notch when we were privy to kind of what was going on in the industry and wanting to make some changes and do things a little bit better than we had seen. Because we've both been administrators, directors at other facilities. Um, And so we created our own very special program. And uh, we really do things out of the box and treat clients on an individual basis, unlike I've ever seen, because I've been in many treatment centers um, as a clinician, as the nurse, as a director. Um, and what we, what we say we do, we really do. Wonder. And I think that's, and I think that's important. You know, there needs to be transparency. Um, you know, we specialize also in the LGBTQ community. Um, not only are we um, LGBTQ friendly, like a lot of treatment facilities say, we are confident, culturally confident to treat this community. Like we are trained and trained and trained. That's great. That's wonderful. Well, well, thank you for explaining that because that's good. That's really unique. And that's a really great um, feature that you offer um, something that you know, that you specialize in. We have Mark and I'm going to. And he's going to get this. Hi, Mark. Hi, how are you? Great, great. I'm going to just re- refigure us here with our, we have all different ways we can be. We can be like that. We can be like Brady Bunch. We can be <laughs> so all certain ways. We'll see. Uh, Hi, Mark. How are you? Good. How are you? Good to see you. Great. It's great. So Mark, Mark is a drug and alcohol attorney. Uh, so Mark, would you like to introduce yourself to everyone before we begin? We're waiting for um, some more guests to come in. Yes, uh, my name is Mark Astor. I'm an attorney. Uh, my office is based in Boca Raton, and I specialize in working with families and individuals who are dealing with uh, drug and alcohol addiction issues. Wonderful, Mark. And uh, I was telling Rachel today our topic is going to be in um, tough love, which is um, and does it really help the addict? And actually, I can put up the. The question here. So if anybody wants to see it, we, we're also going to take comments. If everybody's watching and you have any um, comments, and then we I see we have CC podcast. Okay. CC's here. CC can hear us. Um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to bring, I'm going to be bringing you guys in and out. So you're going to be on screen and off screen and then as you talk. So I'm going to um, put, I'm going to, Rachel, I'm going to move you down for a second. I'm going to bring CC in so she can Say hello. Hello, Cece. How are you? Let me. See. I'm fine. How are you? Great, great. We're so glad that you that you're here with us today. And uh, let me we can I'm just playing around with this. Okay, that's good, Cece. Why don't you tell us a little bit about you? You're very um, interesting story of what you do um, for this topic today. Um, you're an author and an advocate. So tell us um, just real quickly a quick about about yourself and what you do. Okay, so I am a former U.S. Marine, and I also am a former inmate. I was granted clemency in 2012 by Governor Rick Scott, 
And so I just go around now to jails and prisons and I talk to the inmates about how to get their criminal records cleaned up, how they can get it sealed or expunged or pardoned. Wow, that's wonderful. So you're really helping people who've been through a lot and now want a fresh start and they cool. need that. And it's, and it's difficult to get that after, you know, having those uh, the criminal records and stuff too. So that, that makes it very difficult. Well, um, it's, it's only difficult if you don't know the steps. Oh, so, okay. yeah. If you know what to do, which I outline in my book, uh, you, you know, you can follow the steps and then be on the path to get it. Wonderful, wonderful. Okay, that, that is really great. That's great to know. Well, thank you, Cece. Um, we also have, um, okay, Mark Thompson is in the lobby. Mark Burns said, I don't see him in the lobby. So let him try to log in again, Mark. If you're listening, I see your comment here. We don't have him actually in the lobby. Um, I don't see him here. So he, I think he might have to re-log in into the post. Um, so let's get started. Um, we're going to, let me just cycle everybody again. I'm going to bring up, um, I'm going to ask everybody the question, give everybody a chance to comment on this. So I'm going to bring Rachel back first and I'm just going to put Mark down in here and bring her. And Rachel, um, I want you to comment on this about, let's talk about what tough love is and how the term hitting rock bottom has been used in the addiction field. So give us your take as your as a professional on tough love, whether you agree with it, do you feel that it's it's effective or what your thoughts are on that? Um, I, I, I don't think that there's a blanket answer when it comes to tough love. Um, I myself lost a 26 year old brother to this disease. Oh, gosh. Um, and so I can tell you from the family perspective. Okay, for some reason we froze. Uh, we had a little glitch there. Let me try to bring everybody back in here. And if you got logged out, just come right back on. I think we, we lost Rachel in there. I see Mark's here. And if anybody else got logged out, I don't know what, what just happened. We had a little, we're still live, um, but with some people disappeared. So we'll, um, she was in the middle of uh, telling us to see if we can get her back on in a sec. Can you guys hear me? I can hear you, yes. Okay, great. Yeah, we just kind of did a little little glitch there, which uh, Rachel disappeared while she was speaking. So, <laughs> um, so if anybody else who I know we I did see our other guest, Karen Walsh, she was here for a second and then she disappeared. So if you guys just, just click that link and get and log back on and just make sure that you set your cameras so your webcam can see you and your like you guys did in your um, whatever audio system that you're using. Okay, so now that we have, um, I'm gonna, we'll go back to Rachel. Let me throw the same question first to Mark and then to Cece. Mark, um, so what do you feel about tough love? Do you feel like hitting rock bottom is effective? Is it something you advocate or, or what are your thoughts on it? So, so you know, when family, families typically come to me, it's, it's, it's sort of my legal version of rock bottom, right? They, they've exhausted all their other options and they've heard about this thing called the Marchman Act and they come to me and they're like, well, we've heard about this thing called the Marchman Act. Tell us what it is. So... For me, um, as a lawyer, it's about giving them the ability to use the legal system to give them some options where maybe they, in the past they didn't realize they had options. So things like the Marchman Act, um, things like uh, doing a guardianship so you can get control of medical decisions and property. Um, and you know, just recently, one of the other things we're starting to work on is, um, especially where there's a mental health component, and that seems to be the norm these days, there's always a mental health component going on, is, is finding out whether or not they're eligible for some type of, um, you know, uh, financial assistance from the government, you know, social security benefits and disability. And uh, that's something we're doing, uh, uh, we're, we're making available now or something we're working on. So there, you know, for me, when it comes to tough love, you know, the idea of forcing somebody into treatment, you know, for the family is emotional. It's a difficult decision for them to make. But I tell them, listen, you know, this doesn't get better. It's a disease. It's, it's no different from any other disease if you don't. Um, don't work to, 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 to remedy the situation, it's going to get worse, right? They're going to, they're going to continue to relapse. They're going to either end up in the criminal justice system or they're going to end up dead. I mean, that's, 
you know, that's it. So you have to you have to make the decision for them because they can't do it. So in my world, tough love means you know filing a March neck. It means filing a guardianship. So you can make the decisions for them because they're not capable of making this decision on their own. So you got to step up, and yeah, you're going to have to make them go to treatment. And when a judge tells them they're either going to treatment or, or going to jail, that's tough love. But better they go to jail because they won't go to treatment than they end up in the criminal justice system and end up potentially as a convicted felon. And then they end up in prison where they have far more access to drugs than they do on the street. Or worse yet, you end up, you end up with someone in the emergency room and, you know, you lose a loved one. So to me, tough, tough love is really, you know, making that decision where you're going to, you know, let me do my thing and get the courts involved and, and help you from that perspective. And, and I don't always know if, 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 you know, the, and it's, I hate to use the word, typically it's a child, right? A young adult, right? I don't know if, if that son or that daughter has hit rock bottom, but right. I, I think emotionally they're, they're spent. The family's spent. They're all exhausted. So, you know, I know it's hard to give them options and, to, and, and show them a little bit of light at the end of the tunnel because there is light, but you got to, you know, you got to put a plan together for them. And that's what I do. Wonderful. Wonderful. Well, thank you so much, Mark. We're going to, um, that it sounds like I have to that. Can you hear me? <laughs> okay. I'm just going to move. We have um, two more people who are here, two more of our panelists, and I just want to bring um, them up. I see that it's both, um, is that Karen Walsh? I see Scott Brand and Mark Thompson. Um, I'm going to just bring, before we I'm going to have Cece answer the question, I'm just going to um, bring Mark up and then we'll bring Karen up. Okay, so Cece, I want you to answer this question because you have a lot of personal experience with this. Yes, so. And then we'll bring Karen up. Okay, so Cece, I want you to answer this question. This is weird. Yeah, we're getting a little bit of an echo here. Yeah, we have an echo. Okay, that is strange. <laughs> Hold on, guys. I don't know why this is uh, giving us this kind of weird feedback that's going on. Cece, can you hear me? Yes, loud and okay. clear. Okay, sorry about that. I don't know what just went on. Okay, I'm putting these in. I just changed my mic system. Okay, so Cece, um, tell us um, a little bit about your experience with you were in jail. You know, you've, you've lived this as some a former addict, so you know firsthand whether tough love is effective or not. Mm -hmm. You know, I think people will sink to the level of expectation, Okay. And I, I see somebody over there shaking their head and, and saying no. Um, but I, I, I truly do believe that, you know. I, I think once the family makes up their mind um, what they're going to do or not do, then the, the addict or the, the person like myself, you know, they, they follow that. I, I really do believe that, um, you know, I did get in trouble and for me, seeing my family in court, seeing my mother standing in front of that judge crying, I, I just knew that, you know, that was not the way my mother raised me and I just didn't want to put her through that again. All right. So I, I truly believe that people will sink to the level of expectation. So if, if, and you know, like Mark said, that that's kind of very broad and you have to do it on an individual basis. But I do think, you know, some basis has to be set, you know, so that somebody can either, you know, hit it or miss it. But the family has to say what they want. You know, what will they tolerate? You know, when they get to that point, are they there? Do they let do they let the addict know? I, okay, I'm sorry. Thank you, Cece. I'm going to bring um, bring the question now over to Mark. So I'm just going to be muting everybody as they're not speaking, which I just did to myself, so we don't have any feedback. 
So let me unmute Mark. Okay, Mark, hello, how are you? Good afternoon. Please introduce yourself and tell us a little bit of first before you answer the question about where you're from and um, how you help out as people in the addiction community. Sure. Um, my name's Mark Thompson. I am been in the treatment field for just about 20 years. I have also uh, been in personal recovery myself for 22 years. So I've spent, you know, a long time trying to help the sick and suffering. And, you know, I, I've seen it from both sides. I've seen it from, you know, my own personal experience as well as dealing uh, with other people's experiences as well. Thank you so much, Mark. I'm just going to now um, just rotate so we can bring up some more people. Hear me rotate and bring up Karen. And let's see, she'll be on. And then I'm going to bring up, I'm going to just put you down here and I'm going to bring up, I don't know where she went. She disappeared. No. Nope. Okay. Let's see. Uh, no, there she is, Rachel. Okay. And this way, we lost her before. Okay, there we go. Okay, so, hey, Karen, how are you? I'm good. How are you? Wonderful. So great. I'm glad you were able to, to get on. I know it's sometimes a little tech, tech stuff goes on here because we are live, broadcasting live. So we have to expect these kind of little uh, glitches. I know when uh, Rachel was talking, all of a sudden she just disappeared. <laughs> we, we got her back. So let, introduce yourself, Karen, um, and let us know where you're from and what you do. And then the question um, that we were, the first question for everyone was, um, what is tough love and how um, the term hitting rock bottom has been used in the addiction field and what, and what your thoughts are on that. So tell us a little bit of first about yourself. All right, well, my name is Karen Walsh and I work with Inspirations for Youth and Families. And most of my life's work has been with adolescents who are in rehab or struggling with drug abuse. So um, I'm here in South Florida, in Fort Lauderdale, and we have anywhere between 30 and 40 children at all times in a residential setting. So we work with their families, we work with their siblings, and the, the definition of families can vary, as, as we all know, uh, when it comes to uh, people who are coming into treatment. Uh, the definition for uh, tough love and rock bottom is a little bit different for kids. Um, rock bottom because most children that we see coming into treatment have not hit rock bottom, thankfully but their behavior has become so problematic that their parents become concerned for their safety, for their ability to complete their education. And they're really trying to prevent the future adult uh, addicts that will eventually you know, surface at 18, 22, and 24. So I, I won't minimize by saying it's preventative because the disease of addiction is present, the abuse of the drugs and the threat of death is definitely uh, present, but I think that the combination of youth and you know immaturity, uh, lack of knowledge and experience in life as to what they're doing when they're combining drugs, they're quite a bit more reckless uh, than adults are, becomes the reason why um, working with children is different when it comes to rock bottom. And as for tough love, definitely with kids, tough love works. You know, they're still being uh, parented, so the parents have more control and more opportunity to demonstrate that tough love. Uh, there's less willingness for children to go to rehab, although some do willingly, and some of them call on their own seeking help. And then we have to work what, what I would call the reverse admission, which is talking to the parents after we've talked to the teenagers, which is always interesting. Mm -hmm. But um, yeah, okay. the parents typically reach out first and they put down their foot. They say, you know, these are the requirements for you to continue living in this house and having the privileges that you have. And we, uh, we provide interventions as well to assist when those circumstances prevail that require it. And then children come into rehab. Tough love definitely saves their lives. And okay. it has, I think it's made a difference in many of the teenagers moving on, graduating school, high school, moving on to college. And we see quite a bit of success with the teenagers because of tough love. 
Thank you, Karen. And now I just want to move over to Rachel, who was in the middle of us telling us, tragically, your brother passed away um, at age 26 from drug addiction. And, and you were explaining mm -hmm. your thoughts on tough love and, um, and whether hitting rock bottom really works. Um, I'm not <clears throat> quite sure how much um, you heard from me before. So you guys were frozen and I was speaking. So I'm not sure where did I leave off? Where did you hear me? Speak I, th I think we were at the point where it's what you said about um, your brother and then we kind of okay. lost you. Okay. Um, so yes, I lost a 26 year old uh, baby brother. He was a Marine. He was a professional tennis player on his way up. Um, drugs got a hold of him. And I'm, all we knew was tough love. You know, th that's all that my parents ever heard about um, was tough love and rock bottom and you know like I said in that case unfortunately it didn't work for him uh and, and we did try what I was explaining earlier and I again I'm not sure what you heard is that um I think it's important to go case by case with families I treat adults um and obviously very important to us is the family component as this is a family disease and understanding your client um individually so do they have co-occurring mental health disorders? Um, you know, what are some of the other issues? Now we know thyroid is part of, you know, contributes to depression. Is that been checked? We need to understand what's going on with the client individually before we tell maybe the family, you know, put your foot down here. Yes, I, and I do agree with Karen. I mean, tough love can be life-saving. Um, you know, I think my brother would have um, lost his battle with addiction either way. The only thing I say now is that I do believe coming from a place of love and respect and kindness and compassion goes a lot further than everybody just putting their, you know, they leave the parents or they leave their wives or they leave their, you know, their jobs and all of those things. And then they come, you know, to our center and we're then putting down the expectations and putting our feet down. And, you know, I think there's a nuance in the way that you carry forth um, with what you expect from your clients. And uh, like I said, you know, tough, tough love comes in all different ways. Um, and, and where does the family need to be? I think has a lot to do as clinicians. We know we want to meet our clients where they are. So you have somebody who is participating, who's doing well, who's attempting to do all the right things, who's taking the medication, but still struggling. That wouldn't be where I would tell the parent, you know, put your foot down, say this or say that we have to come together collectively always to find out what's going on. You know, are they on the wrong medication? Is there other some, um, you know, um, mental health diagnosis that has not revealed itself yet? Is there some physiological issue? So along the way, I think it's important to determine when tough love comes in. And I did speak earlier about, you know, if you have a client and we've all seen this down here, if you have a client who has a really, you know, ha has their insurance card and they're using insurance as a revolving door, their insurance card, you know, I'm going to go out, I'm going to get high, I'm going to use, and I'm going to go back into treatment because I know that I can, um, you know, then I think tough love definitely needs to be um, talked about. And, and what does that mean? If you're enabling your family member because they have an insurance card, and you're paying their rent every time they want to go to another facility because maybe they just heard no. And, and we, we know how that works. Um, hearing no is very difficult early on. But going forward, you know, depending on how the client's behaving, do we want all clients to hit rock bottom? Absolutely not. Do some of them need to in efforts um, to make their own decision about what they want for their life? Absolutely. Well, you know, it's, it's, it's interesting because, you know, when we talk about, you know, with like from the mother or father or the wife or husband's perspective, the loved one's perspective, you know, you're told, okay, you know, you have to set boundaries, don't give them any money, don't, you know, put them out on the street. Um, and it's like, it goes against the nature, of, especially for a mother, mother, it literally goes against their, their, as a mother to do something, but it's what you told you have to do to save that child's life um, but yet it doesn't always work 
So it's a really, it's, I know any of the moms and parents and, um, you know, people who are right now watching the show, who have a loved one out there and you're, you know, you're doing all these things. You're not giving them money. You're not allowing them to stay at the house. You're doing all these things. It's still not working. Um, I'm going to throw this question over to, to Mark now, gave him a chance and rotate everybody back in. So um, let me ask you, Mark, let me just uh, put this, I'm going to bring Cece back in. And Mark, what are your thoughts on that? Like, what would you tell a parent right now who's watching the show? Um, you know, what advice would you give them when dealing with this? Well, you know, so I think what they need to, to understand is they got to put a plan of action together, right? I mean, I think that's the, the, the biggest fear for them. They just don't know what to do. So, I mean, I think that there needs to be a, um, a treatment component. Um, there needs to be an emotional component, right? Dealing with you know, the, the family's issues because this, you know, when it comes to, to, to dealing with this issue, it's, as I tell my families, this is a marathon, not a sprint, right? They've been sick for a long time. It's going to take them a long time to get well. I mean, if someone's been abusing opioids for five or 10 years, they're not getting better in 30, 60, 90, or even 180 days. I mean, this is a lifestyle change. And it's going to take them time to adapt to the new, you know, their new lifestyle. And so that they need to understand that. So I think you have to give them the, you know, the picture and you have to give them the, the plan of action. And, you know, at least from my perspective as a lawyer, while I can, you know, give them the legal options, I, I rely very heavily on, you know, you know, the treatment centers and therapists um, to help to put all the other pieces together. Because otherwise, I mean, going at the court and getting a Mar Marchman Act or, or, or a guardianship is, it's really sort of just an exercise of utility if you don't have the plan to then execute on, right? You've no point getting a March Act order if you don't have someone to send it to treatment. Or if it's Mark, not the right I'm sorry to interrupt. Can you tell us, because there may be people watching right now, because Marchman Act is, is native, I believe, to formerly to Florida. Can you explain what the Marchman Act is for anybody who may not understand that term? Okay, so the Marchman Act is a, is a Florida uh, is a Florida statute. It's been, been on the books since 1993. But basically what it allows a family member or a guardian or a relative or a friend or, or basically somebody with personal knowledge. It gives them the ability to go into court and ask a judge to order their loved one um, initially into a five-day period of assessment, stabilization, and detox. That period can be extended a little bit, but it's basically five days. Um, and the idea is to get them stable and, and to get somebody to make a determination as to what is the next step. So from a legal perspective, once that once that is done, and, and to be fair, it's done on an ex parte basis, which means that the person on the other end, the respondent, isn't going to get a chance to contest it. If it's legally sufficient, in other words, it, it ticks all the boxes, the legal boxes, the judge is going to review it, they're going to grant it, and they're going to issue a pickup order and basically tell the local sheriff, go and get this person, this is where they are, and take them to this place so they can be assessed stabilized and detoxed during that five day window i'm then going to sit down i'm going to file a second petition which is going to ask the court to send that person to some type of treatment program based on the assessment that's that's being done while they're being stabilized and that that second part can that can become adversarial because you're taking someone's liberty away right you're, you're basically forcing them into treatment and so they get an opportunity to be heard and to contest it. And if they can't afford a lawyer, they're entitled to court-appointed counsel to contest it. But basically, it's a two-step process um, done in any county in which the respondent is located, which enables you to get them into treatment. Because you've got to remember, at this point, they're not capable of making that rational decision for themselves. You've got to make it for them. Thank you, Mark. Thank you for explaining that. Um, and it's this is just Florida. There's no other states that have they may have similar types of acts, but it's they're called different things. I'm assuming in okay, different so states. I believe there are 37 other states that have some type of involuntary commitment statute. Some of them okay. drugs, some are for alcohol, some of them mental health, some of them are, are for a combination. They're all over the map, and that's you know one of the things I've been talking about is we need some type of federal standard when it comes to involuntary commitment. But there is a lot of talk about having that happen. I mean, it, it's coming to you know, it's, it, you see, I see it online. I see it in the press. People are starting to talk about these involuntary commitment statutes because if we don't intervene quickly, the problem gets worse, and then we know what the ramifications of that are. So intervening early is good, and sometimes you've got to ask the courts to help you with that. I can't hear you. 
We can't hear you. I'm sorry. It's very good to know anybody who's watching the show right now and your, your loved one who's or yourself, who, you know, not in Florida and you're not familiar with this. There are different states. You should check with your local, um, you know, you can Google it in your state of if you're dealing with, um, you know, an addicted loved one who's out of control or going to hurt themselves. And there are some laws that can help you. And here in Florida, it's called the Marchman Act. So I'm going to thank you, Mark. I'm going thank to. You, um, okay. One other quick um, thing. The, sure. the thing about the Marchman is because we bring so many people into treatment down here in Florida. They don't have to be a resident of Florida to be Marchman Act. Their feet touch the ground in Florida, the county in which they're located, you can file a Marchman Act petition. It doesn't matter whether they, whether their state of residence. If they're here in Florida, they can be Marchman Acted. Oh, all right. That's interesting. That's really, that's good to know. And there are so many different people flying from all over the country yeah. here to Florida for treatment. So that's important to know that we can, we can help people. Thank you so much, Mark. Um, I'm going to ask... I mean, CC, and I'm going to bring up our, well, we lost him now. We have Mark, and I was going to bring you up, and I don't know wh where you went. He, he's coming in and out, our Mark Thompson. Um, let me bring in Karen again, and let me ask CC now to um, to tell, what would you tell me? You lived it. You were talking before about your mother and how mm -hmm. seeing your mother, you know, that just broke your heart. And, and it is such a heartbreaking thing because it's addiction seems to me like, you know, it's easy for so many people have this misconception that, um, and I used to have it myself, you know, it's a choice, it's a choice. You know, you just don't pick up that, that drug or you don't do it, but we forget that, um, there's a lot of things going on. Uh, a lot of times with dual diagnosis, there's a lot of things going on with the, the brain disorders, all sorts of things that make, make somebody become an addict and they lose control and they don't want to hurt their families. Right. Um, so what would you say as far as, you know, as a, because since you were the addict, I'm going to ask Mark Thompson the same question because you both, you know, are rec have recovered. Um, what would you tell a mother or father or a loved one right now? What do you do? They're feeling guilty about doing tough love. Do you tell them, go, go with it, stick with it, just do it? Or what is your advice? Um, it really depends on the plan that you and the professionals have come up with. You know, I think when, uh, I forget who said that earlier, it has to be a part of the plan. Um, and then once that plan is in place. Yes, you do have to stick with it. And that can be the tough part, you know? And, right, and that could be the hard part. But let's say there is a plan, you have a plan, you're the mom and it, they're telling you, the professionals, you need to, you know, let this this kid hit rock bottom. Don't give him any money when he calls three o'clock in the morning, don't bail him out of jail and your heart's breaking, you know? And so as you, Cece, would say, you know, mom, stick with the plan, would you tell them that? Yes, yes, I Even definitely. though it's gonna break your heart, you can be saving your child's life. You know, it's because it's either, um, you know, it, it, it hurts now or it breaks later. Right, right, and you're you your family, did they do tough love with you? Or it was uh, yeah. more, okay, yes. and, then it, and it worked. You're here alive today, successful author. Uh -huh. What's the name of your book, by the way? Okay, my book is called The Florida Clemency Guide. And if people email me, I'll send them the, the free ebook version of it. So just outlining the steps uh, because people don't know what to do, whether they can get their records sealed or expunged or pardoned. And those terms just are out there. So if, if people email me and uh, we'll, I'm, I guess you'll give the my email at the end. What, what is your uh, email? I can put it in the comments right now. Okay. So it's cc, c-e-c-e, -E, at I speak in prisons with an S dot com. Okay. Okay. So everybody, I'm just putting her email address fast in the comments here. Um, I just commented. So definitely get that ebook. That would be really, really helpful. Thank you so much, Cece. Um, we got, I'm going to bring, we just bring in Mark. Um, so I wanna, and then I'm going to ask um, Karen the same question. So let me just bring you guys in. We keep losing Mark, but he's back. Okay. This is Mark Thompson. Um, and then we're going to have Karen ask the same question. So Mark, there you are. <laughs> we kept losing you back and forth. Um, you also mentioned that you were a recovering addict. Correct. And um, so, so tell us um, what I just asked you is the same question. You know, there's a, you did your parents um, do tough love with you? Because obviously you're alive, you're here, you're successful. Um, was that the, the route that they did your loved ones that helped you? Or was that not something that was done with you and it had no impact? 
it, it, it was not done with me. And, and the reason being is, is I tended to hide my addiction from my family. And, and to be honest, they didn't really know how bad it was getting until um, I was out of the house for a while. Um, and, and so for me, they didn't really have to, to, to deal with it as much. Um, uh, but I would say that it's probably one of the more difficult aspects of my professional life. Uh, getting a mom or a dad on the phone who are hurting or heartbroken, who are at their wit's end. Uh, what do I do? And uh, it's been my experience that the most effective, the most, um, the most effective thing that I can say to them is, is exactly what you were just saying. When the phone rings at 3 a.m., they say, you know, your, your child needs 50 bucks to pay the FPL bill, which A, is, you know, obviously not true. you got to say no. you got to say no. And, and I guess it, it's a tough situation to be in. I feel so sorry for these, these parents who are faced with the choice of, do I continue to support my child even though I know the things that he or she is doing could potentially kill them? Um, or do I say no and risk allowing them to be homeless in jail, uh, suffer some other form of consequence, which, which hurts them just as much. Uh, it's, it's a rock and a hard place question. Uh, Absolutely. Based on my experience, the answer is there's, there's no reason for somebody to stop as long as the safety net is always there. Why change the behavior? If, yeah, that's if, right. It's because you feel like they're, there's always that, like somebody wants to put it in the, there's that pillow, you put a place in the pillow under their butt. They're not, you know, falling hard enough. Um, but yeah, and I'm going to um, want to bring Lori on, um, Karen, I'm sorry, I'm saying Lori. Don't worry, I got that from Karen. <laughs> I see Scott there. Karen, yeah. you, um, come back. Is, have, is Karen there? Or? Well, believe it or not, she's on the uh, campus and there's a tough love uh, situation we have. Oh, with the wow. Ironically. Right. So Ironically. To, wow. Uh, maybe she could come back shortly, but I just wanted to stand by and let you know that. Um, that's just okay. the craziness of our business with teens. Yes. Well, we're, we're going to be here. So if she wants to pop back on, I'm just going to move. I'm going to ro I'm just rotating everybody. So I'm going to rotate you down and then rotate you, but you'll still, you'll still be able to see us here. Um, and let me rotate um, Rachel back up to the broadcast here. Um, and, you know, this is the thing when I think about this, like, uh, so we're doing a little research on this as well. And, you know, there's some school of thought that says, well, you know, addiction is a disease. So if you had somebody with cancer, you wouldn't throw them out of the house. You would not give them food. You wouldn't do all these things. So that's a lot of times you, you it is a very confusing thing for people who love an addict because, yes, <clears throat> it, it is a disease, but it's a disease that literally has all these psychological ramifications and that are dealing with that. So Rachel, can you talk a little bit about that? Um, what are your thoughts on that? And, and funny enough, that was going through my head as you were speaking. I often use that analogy um, with families and clients, you know, about having cancer and it's a disease. So I, I think you need to look at the situation. Like I said, it's all individualized. There, there's, there's the client that's in treatment and then there's the kid or the family member that's running the streets. So if you have a loved one that's running the streets that won't get into treatment, um, that has been stealing from you and family members and abusing you and taking money, tough love is absolutely the way to go. And I guess from a more clinical point of view, it, it's about having boundaries and very strong boundaries. You know, I will not accept you doing drugs in my home. I will not accept you taking my car in the middle of the night to go on a drug run, or I will call the police and say that it is stolen. So I, I believe that, that, you know, tough love is a necessary, necessary evil, again, depending on the situation. Um, and when my brother was running the streets and, you know, not adhering to what the family 
would have liked to have happen. Tough love was the only way to go, and it still didn't save him. So the yes. other end of right, and the other end of the spectrum is the client that is in treatment, who's trying, who's behaviorally appropriate, who um, you know does need cigarettes, and uh, you know we. T- I, I'm a holistic practitioner if nothing else and and i hate cigarettes and i hate smoke and and all of that and i'm in a consortium for cancer so you know that's a no for me but i'll tell you when they come into treatment that's part of their socialization because when they're all in group and they're processing you know the real work happens when they go downstairs and they take their smoke break and they kind of vibe off of each other so you know you have to consider exactly where the claim is at so I think that's I very think, good advice, yes. Right. So, you know, depending on the behavior of, of whom we're speaking about, you know, tough love has its merits. It used to be the only thing we knew. I started 25 years ago in this business. I would work with some of the best old-time, old-school clinicians that were in your face. You know, you're an addict, you're uh, this, and, you know, you're not going to be anything. For me, that does not work in treatment at this point. You know, my, my staff has been trained to treat people with, like I said, kindness, dignity, because they do have a disease. I'm a medical practitioner as well, so I come from the medical model. Um, and again, if you've not tried all the things that you might necessarily need to have in place, like I said, you know, medication, behavioral modification, um, understanding what's really going on with the client, severe trauma, um, you, you want to look at things differently. That's not the time for the family to back out and go, you know, I'm not taking your call. I'm not going to give you money for cigarette. You know, if they're doing the right thing, I encourage the families to do the right thing. If, if they're in solution, I encourage the family to be in solution. If, if they're not in solution and they're, they're in, you know, the other side, then I don't want the parents, the family, the loved ones to be part of the problem. Right. And, and you need to really understand that. It's a more of a loving, tough love is what you're saying. You know, and I think that's you important know, too. What, what you just said, just to reiterate what you just said was important. You said that before, you know, if they're doing, you know, it's the same thing we and that put the analogy back of, um, with cancer or with a disease. If somebody who has cancer, God forbid, doesn't go for treatment, doesn't go see the doctor, doesn't, you know, take care of themselves. Right. You still love that person, but... You, you're not going to give them, buy them another pack of cigarettes if they're, say they have lung cancer and they refuse to get any treatment. So it's the same right. thing in your head you have to think about as, as I know this is just a, a huge issue that so many mothers and parents and loved ones deal with. You have to think about that. You got to be loving. Maybe it's the word tough love and hitting rock bottom has to be changed, that it's um, a loving way of putting boundaries, setting boundaries and saying, if you, you know, if you're going to help yourself, we're going to help you. If not, we'll love you, but we just cannot participate in your behavior. We can't give you money. We can't do do all these things. Yeah, absolutely. I I think it's, it's very important to be informed. Again, I believe it's individualized for every person that we come across. Um, Right. You know, I'm sure that Mark has seen a thousand times, you know, at the end of the day, some people do, need to be in jail because that's the safest place for them. You know, right. of course they say that they can get high there, but they, they're not going to overdose in jail. I mean, what well, the th- that's going to be what I want to segment into right now. I'm glad you brought that up because I want to bring out Mark and Cece right now to talk about because their experiences with prison and the ultimate extreme tough love. So I'm just going to thank you so much, Rachel. I'm just going to um, bring uh, you down and Cece back in because uh, I know they both have experience with this. So Mark, um, what are your thoughts about that? I mean, is it obviously jail is the ultimate version of the extremely one of the before death, they would probably be the worst way you could hit rock bottom is to be spending, you know, time in jail or be put into um, isolation in jail for your, when you're an addict. Uh, what are your thoughts on that? Because you're now representing addicts in court. So are you saying to the families and to the judge, don't put them in jail or has it been cha- times when jail was the best thing for them? So, so, you know, it really depends. I, I sort of have my own sort of personal benchmark. And I, 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 in my head, I'm, I'm saying to myself, is this person savable, right? I mean, are we at a point where we can reverse what's been going on? It's, you know, Rachel brought up cancer, right? I mean, you get to a certain stage. I think it's stage four where the person's not savable anymore. And I think to a certain extent that, that you know, 
that works too with addiction. And, and there's a certain point where you just can't reverse the trend. They've been so addicted for so long. You know, you, you know unless um, dramatic steps are taken, it's not going to change. So, I mean, you know, my sort of benchmark is, are they stable? So when I'm in, I'm in court and I've got a judge who wants to throw somebody in, either in the county jail or the state penitentiary, um, if I think that they're, if, based on what they told me, if there's, if there's some plan of action that could be put together that, the, the, you know, the defendant who, who's now my client, right, um, is, is willing to engage in, then, then I'm willing to make that pitch to the judge. But at some point, the judge is going to say, listen, you know, my overriding um, responsibility is to make sure society is protected. And if you're breaking into houses and cars and stealing stuff to feed a habit that you're either not capable of addressing or not willing to address, even if I force you to, then I don't have any choice. I got to put you in jail or I got to put you in the state penitentiary to make sure that you don't commit more crimes because I got to protect society from you. And so, you know, there comes a point in time where the person's not savable. Um, and even if you think they're savable, the judge is like, listen, it's too far gone and I'm not willing to take that chance. So, you know, let them get, you know, let them get detoxed and stabilized and recovered in, you know, in a locked up facility. And then when they get back out, if they're willing to go to treatment, well, great. Um, I'll be there cheering on the sideline. But at some point in time, you just, you know, you know, jail is maybe the, the best place for them because they're just not, you know, you just can't. And maybe this is just. It's not maybe they're just not ready for it. I mean, you know, there's a number of factors, but at some point they're just, you know, they're just more of a candidate for custody than they are for treatment. And that's just the I, bottom line sort of thing. And, you know, now just putting over to Cece, this is exactly what happened to you, right, Cece? Um, yeah. you, you credit jail with with saving your, your life, right? I mean, basically, I forget you work with your addiction. So tell us a little bit about that from your perspective as somebody who actually lived through it. Okay, so jail is for up to a year and prison is a year and a day more. So not that jail is easy, but you know, basically you can sail through that. You're in a county facility, um, but when you go to prison, that that's totally, totally different. You are there with the hardest of the hard. You know, I remember um, at one point I was in a cell with a lifer who was a heroin addict. Nothing could have prepared me for that. And she was going through withdrawals and it was the scariest thing ever. And I just thought to myself like, whoa, like, no, you know? So all along the way I had wake up calls, all right? Um, and then going back to what Rachel was saying about if somebody has cancer, yes, drug addiction is a disease, just like cancer. But at some point, and I came across the situation the other day where a, a friend of mine had to cut somebody off and do tough love with somebody who had cancer because they were in, and I know it sounds shocking, they were in treatment they got homesick and they came back home and they just wanted to be in that emotional whirlwind. It was like, you went to get a, a drink of water and they were like, oh, but I have cancer. It was like, but you're not doing anything for it. You're not willing to make the changes that you have to, to overcome it. So that's where I really say that you know, in that case, the family had to say, well, if you're not going to do anything, then we can't support you in this emotional world way. And so for me, that's what tough love and hidden rock bottom means. Sometimes if someone is put into prison, if they're, you know, they have an addiction, it absolutely does work. It absolutely does. I mean, if in my case, I was put in with these hardcore people. I didn't want to do that. Uh, going to prison one time was good enough for me. I don't ever want to go back. And you know, it's it's interesting because this brings us to the point. Um, another question is when we talk about dual diagnosis, which means that there's something else going on. I mean, you've got people who are obviously addiction being a disease, they're addicted, 
but then you have people who are dealing with maybe being bipolar and self-medicating themselves mm-hmm. or they're, they're, um, you know, they've got OCD and they just compulsive and they can't stop and they're schizophrenic or whatever they have. Now you've got a more serious problem and even a bigger dilemma, I think with, with, with the tough love issue, because, um, I think a lot of times these people are being treated, um, as, strictly as for addiction and they're not taking the meds for the, the mental health issues and the addiction takes over, but really the, the mental health issues have to be fixed first. So they, they would stop the addiction. Right. So it's like a really, it's a really a tough place. I'm going to ask Mark Thompson now, um, Mark, what are your thoughts on that? Have you dealt with patients with that, where it was probably most difficult thing, the dual diagnosis of trying to treat an addict with um, concurring, you know, mental disorders? It, it's part of it's part and parcel with the the treatment field. Um, people who come in with multiple diagnoses, they have a tough road to hoe. Not only do they have to try and deal with their addiction, they have you know mood disorders, thought disorders, different kinds of disorders that that dissuade them from getting treatment for um, their their addiction. Um, and so the question is, which came first, the, the addiction? Is that, is that bringing on the mental illness or did the mental illness bring on the addiction? And, and to my point of view, the answer is it doesn't matter. We have to treat both. We have to treat um, not just one more than the other. We have to treat them both as primary disorders because the, the, the studies are clear, and, and from my own experience, I've seen it. You don't treat one, the other gets worse. Um, and so if you can treat both of them concurrently, then the interventions you use with one can help with motivation and progress with the other. Um, and and that's, that is, is something that generally... Um, needs to be addressed in a, in a structured environment um, where there are those boundaries, where there is some, some structure and some, some, for lack of a better term, tough law. Uh, yes, you have to take your meds. Yes, you have to do it three times a day. Um, yes, you have to get out, up, out of bed. But it's been my experience that if they are willing to to be be directable. It has benefit. It may take a while, and there might be some pain and discomfort involved. But if they are internally motivated enough to do it, uh, eventually people do get better. Uh, and if that motivation has to be generated externally at first, be it through mom, dad, court system, wife, whatever, so be it. Um, yeah, I, I, I definitely believe in that. I think what you're saying is, is really true. I just think that the one of the um, the main problems that you have, say, let's use bipolar, for example. So we have someone who um, won't take their bipolar medicine, or maybe they're taking bipolar medicine, but it's not at, work, it's not at the level that it's worn off, it's not working, they don't go back to the doctor, they go out and they're binging, they're doing drugs to medicate themselves. Um, when we apply the tough love to, to that, then it gets a little tricky, well, right? So I wanted to ask Rachel about that. What are your thoughts too on that? Well, yeah. Um, one thing I wanted to piggyback on about jail, um, I believe in diversion programs, conversion programs. I don't think that people get <clears throat> well in jail, but what I think happens in jail, um, which sometimes even the greatest treatment team in the world can't accomplish is while somebody's in jail, they're giving their, their brain time to heal. So, you know, it's like a bullseye. Uh, And and when somebody's using opiates and they're drinking and using benzos and you're trying to give them a little bit of, you know, maybe Lexapro over here, but it's like a bullseye and you're throwing a hundred darts. So it's going to, you know, knock the Lexapro right out. And and what's going to target the receptors is going to be um, from the drugs and alcohol. So what happens, you know, the good side or the upside, if there is any about somebody who we just find treatment resistant, who ends up in jail for a while is that guess what the neuro 
neurotransmitters get a chance to really heal because the drugs are no longer hijacking, you know, all, all, all of that. So that's the upside for me with jail. And of course, keeping them safe from themselves. Um, but I also, you know, we talked about rock bottom too. And rock bottom, believe it or not, doesn't always work either. I've had clients who have been in the most destitute, unbelievable situations. I've had a client come into detox after. I think we can't hear you. Can you, uh, the, we kind of lost you there with the sound. Okay. Can you hear me now? Yeah, we can yes. hear you now. Now. So uh, I've had clients that have come and have been brought to a detox the day they overdosed um, and had been worked on for hours and end up using the next day. So sometimes rock bottom, even to the depths of, you know, you were just dead yesterday. Sometimes it, it doesn't even matter to them. Right. Um, so again, like I say, it's, it's all individualized. But what's really important to know in treating clients is that if they have co-occurring um, mental health disorders, is that, uh, like I was saying in the beginning, the drugs are targeting the same receptors. You know, the drugs take over the serotonin, the dopamine, the norepinephrine. Um, and those are things that we need to help them re-regulate. So it, it is a battle because, mm -hmm. you know, there's been damage to the receptors and then you're trying, Lexapro is an SSRI, you know, a serotonin um, uptake inhibitor so that they can start to hold serotonin a little longer in the receptors. But if they've been using, like Mark said, opiates for 10 years, those receptors are damaged. And, you know, it's a hard fix. It's really Absolutely. a hard fix. Absolutely. Well, I just want to ask Mark um, Astor right now, just um, a question I have on this with where we're going back to, you know, the dual diagnosis and the mental illness. Um, and I know legally it's, you know, we've as a country have gotten away from institutionalizing putting people in mental hospitals because of the horrors that happened in the past. Yet it seems to me that it's um, there's more of a thing to take an addict dual diagnosis to put them into a treatment center than there is to commit them. It's very hard to commit somebody, either for even for a short term stay in a mental institute uh, into you know a hospital, a mental hospital, where maybe sometimes that's what they need more than first going to the addiction treatment. Maybe they have need to go there first. What what are your thoughts, Mark, on that legally? So. So I think for Rachel, before we tell you, right, most most of the time now, there's there's a there's a co-occurring mental health issue going on, and sometimes there's a chicken and egg thing. You know, you don't always know what came first, and sometimes right. they they had a mental health issue going on, so they started to self-medicate because they feel better, um, right. or they got hooked on opioids for various reasons, and that caused them, a, you know, an imbalance in the brain. And then that, so either way, you've got both things to, to do. I I personally find, just from my experience. That when when I'm filing the first petition for assessment and stabilization and detox, when I know there's a mental health issue going on, I like to put them in a hospital setting. It's the safest place for them. It's the safest place for everybody else. And because you know you're in a, a, a hospital setting where you have a lot of medical doctors running around the place, right? There, are, I think probably it's the best setting for them because they can they can address that immediate need to get them stabilized from a from a mental emotional and mental perspective, right? Because once you you can you sort of take that 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 strong desire to self medicate and feel better, and you can get them a little bit balanced, that not only does it does it make the process easier from a legal perspective, but they start to feel a little bit better, and now they start to think a little bit more rationally, and they start to be a little bit more open to the idea of getting treatment. So when I get into court on on the petition number two, asking the, the court to send them, you know, to a, a treatment facility of some type for you know 30, 60, 90 days. They're a little bit more amenable to it than they had been initially when they were first court ordered to say a hospital to get stabilized. Great, great. And thank you for explaining that. And this has been, uh, you know, I think it's a great amount of information from everybody today. We're, we're actually at an hour right now. And I want to give everybody a chance to be able to, first of all, I'm just going to look and see if there's any questions to um, close out and give um, your contact information. Um, I would encourage everybody too to go back to the broadcast and, and um, comment in the bottom of where your, you know, your phone number, your email address, everything that you're going to, we're going to rotate now. Um, let me just, I'm going to rotate it back so we give everybody a chance to be able to 
uh, tell us about again where we can reach you um, because there's going to be you know so many loved ones watching the show so many people who are, are dealing with addiction who really need help we get addiction 911 we're just a resource our show our podcast our magazine we're a resource um i get calls personally on my cell phone because myself i don't know how my cell phone is on the internet with the show um the show um i've gotten calls in the middle of the night from people from all over the country asking me you know i need i want to come to florida i need help you know so i always put that in our group our florida addiction professionals association group and give you guys the the lead but it's it's heartbreaking for me because i don't i'm not an addiction professional um you know i've actually had loved ones you know who are to have dealt with addiction but i've never you know i'm not you so that's why I, the, the purpose of this show is to merge you guys together it's for people out there watching right now to say you know what these are really top-notch professionals here on the show who are ready and available to help and how can we get in touch with you so i'm going to start with mark thompson um and just tell us mark where we can um you know how we can get in touch with you your phone number email address um, the name again of of the treatment facility um this way everybody knows how to get in touch with you thank you uh, christina i i'm the clinical director at heartstone recovery center it's in lantana and we answer our phones 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Uh, we're in the business of, of helping the sick and suffering for the last 17 years. Right here, and our number is 561-586-3554. And you can contact me directly at mthompson at heartstonerecovery.com. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Mark. Um, CC, tell us uh, all about how to get in touch with you. Again, I did put your email address in the comments, but we you know, just tell us a little bit about the resource that you're providing everyone um, and how you help, you know, how you could help people with, with the legal ramifications after they um, get out of prison. Okay. So my email address is CC, spelt out C E C E, at I speak in prisons with an S dot com. And if you send me an email, I will send you a free ebook, a quick guide on figuring out whether your record can be sealed, expunged, or pardoned. So I kind of deal with people on the back end after they've been straight for a while, in recovery for a while, and they want to get their, their criminal and arrest record cleaned up. But let me say this, I'm not a lawyer. I'm not, I'm not giving any legal advice. All I'm doing is really talking about <laughs> my experience and what have you. And I, if people start asking me legal questions, I always refer them to the lawyers. So um, okay. it's just a quick, a quick guide. So we've got your email address. If you want to give out a phone number or anything else for anybody to well, reach you, or just email is the best way to reach you? Email is the best way. So okay. cc at ispeakinprisons.com. And definitely people take advantage of this because this is a great resource that I've never, I have not seen a lot of that CC provides um, to really help people who are dealing with that. You know, when you're 16, 17 years old and you, you, know, you get a felony charge and now you go to get a job, you're 28, you're clean, and now you're, people are, you know, you still have that mark on you. So CC is the person who can help you with that. Thank you so much, CC. So Mark Esther, um, just tell us how we can get in touch with you. Um, you know, what exactly a phone number, email address, um, this way, you know, parents or, or people who are dealing with legal troubles now due to drug and alcohol, um, can contact you and your firm. Okay. So my phone number is 561-419-6095. That's 561-419-6095. My email address is Mark with a K. So it's M-A-R-K at then Aster, A-S-T-O-R, lawfirm.com. So Mark at Aster, lawfirm.com. And if that doesn't work, they can go to my website, which is drug and alcohol attorneys with an S, dot com. Drug and alcohol attorneys, dot com. Wonderful. Thank you so much for, for all your expertise today, Mark. And Rachel, um, I'm going to also bring up uh, Scott to talk. Rachel, tell us where everyone can get in touch with you. I know you, right now you're in Canada. Actually, I don't think everybody knows this, but Rachel's on vacation in Quebec. It was nice enough to join us from uh, all the way from Quebec. Isn't that cool? <laughs> Montreal, yes. Yes. Wonderful. So how do we get in touch with you, Rachel? Okay. So, again, I own Dynamic Recovery Center in Fort Lauderdale, Florida. 
um, and Dynamic Counseling Center. Um, Dynamic Counseling Center is outpatient and Dynamic Recovery Center. Um, also really specializing in the LGBTQ community. Um, and you can reach me. The admission line actually goes to me 24 hours a day, which is 754-999-0822. And you can certainly email me at Rachel, R-A-C-H-E-L, at dynamicrecoverycenter.com. And I want to thank you so much for, Christina, for having us on this show. Thank wonderful. you. Thank you. This has been, been fantastic. Thank you so much, Rachel, for your expertise okay. today. So, Scott, um, I know um, uh, Karen's off on an emergency, but if you can just give us, um, you know, her contact information for in inspirations for youth and family. Yes, I would be very happy to do that. You can reach Karen's email at kctalkabout at aol.com. And for inspirations for youth and families, our phone number, toll-free number is 855-240-6589. And website is inspirationsyouth.com. Wonderful. Great. I want to thank everyone else here today. I'm just in looking through the comments. Thank you, Grace, for your comments. Um, Grace uh, left a comment. You guys can read the comments here. Luna. Hello, Luna. Um, thanks for, for watching the show. Um, and uh, Kimberly and Mark Burns. And uh, this is just wonderful. Our next show is going to be on July 13th. And we're going to go dive a little bit deep into, um, you know, uh, blaming the addict, which seems to be a societal thing where people are really feeling angry toward addicts. Um, you know, there's the, um, is it a disease or is it a choice? Um, and I want to, I want to get the professionals opinions on this really loud and clear because I encountered all the time when I speak to people who are uneducated or just are very, you know, hostile toward the fact that these addicts are doing this themselves and they're ruining everything. And they, they can, you know, they don't have an understanding of it to have that compassion. So I think we can educate people and help them to see the other side of it. Um, so um, hopefully some of you will be joining us back on that show um, as well. And that'll be on July 13th. Well, thank you everyone so much um, from the Addiction by Ron show. This again, we can listen to this on, on iTunes, on Podomatic, and it's going to be um, shared all over social media and on our blog at addiction911blog.com. And I encourage all the panelists again to go into the comments and Tag yourselves, put your phone numbers, information this way. These can easily uh, watch this back or just click on the links and message you and, and get the information that they need. So thanks again, everyone. It was a wonderful see seeing everybody today. Thank you so much. Take care. Bye-bye.